Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Knox. I'm the Curator of Education here at Connecticut Spiritually Zoo, and I'm also a proud member of the Explorers Club. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Monday Night Lectures and World Elephant Week 2021 at the Explorers Club. Tonight through Thursday, we're going to be meeting experts from around the world, and we're going to hear the tip of the iceberg tonight, and we're going to expand upon that as we look at anatomy, intelligence, um, and, and elephant behavior and the many issues facing elephant populations around the world. Before we begin, I'd like to thank a few key people who made this evening, this entire evening, in fact, this entire week possible. And they include Rosemary Keough, Patricia Sims, Chair of Programs and Passer, of course, uh, Mark Fowler, Satish Venkatesh. And I, I just want to mention that uh, Anne had, had said that What's better than one day of elephants? Well, a whole week of elephants. So that's what we're bringing to all of you tonight. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, these magnificent pachyderms and what we can all do to keep them safe from all threats, most of all human. Tonight, we're gonna start off with Elephants 101 and learn a bit about African and Asian elephants. And we're also gonna hear some special presentations about their trunks in particular. Before we get to our first guest presenter, I wanna share a few cool elephant facts with you. And I say cool because I'm the parent of three children and cool rates with them. So cool rate with us, I hope. Well, elephants are magnificent creatures, as we all know. They're so iconic of, of the wild when it comes to Africa or Asia. But what we may not know is that the more we study them, the more these facts emerge that shed a new light on these animals. For one, elephants are able to detect the scent of water from miles away. And they can do that by waving their trunk in the air and picking up moisture in the airborne droplets and the micro droplets. Also, elephants are able to communicate via infrasound. Many of us know this, and we'll be exploring this this week, but infrasound enables animals to, to communicate over vast distances where they can't physically see one another, over miles and kilometers. Another interesting elephant fact, or I think a very cool elephant fact when it comes to the African or bull savanna elephant, these animals are able to live not only in the savannas, but also in deserts. There are elephants that live along the skeleton coast and in Africa, and these animals have adapted to a desert lifestyle. So can you imagine an animal that weighs four or five tons eking out an existence as an herbivore in the desert? Well, you don't have to imagine it because elephants make it happen every day. Also, elephants are, are remarkably constructed creatures. They're, they're marvels of, of natural design by mother nature. An elephant's skull, an elephant's head rather, weighs about 25% of its body mass. For humans, we have a mere 8% of our body mass. That's our head, right? But elephants have to have this, this massive head because the head is responsible for cooling the massive beast. It's also responsible for supporting the trunk, which we'll learn about later, and the tusks. Now, most elephants have tusks. We'll learn all about the details when it comes to tusks, but I will just say that Mother Nature never designed a more adaptable tooth, right? The tusk can ward off a crowd of lions. It can knock over a tree. It can scoop out mud in a water hole. It can do it all. So that's just a little bit. And by the way, before I forget, what am I doing? I've got one right here, right? So the tusk is a marvel of nature. And we're gonna be learning more about that from our experts in just a few minutes. Now to kick it off, we've got a very special guest presenter and I'm going to, uh, I wanna do justice to him by, by, I wanna read his bio or brief excerpt of his bio right now. So I can just, uh, I can get that for you, but I'll see Mr. Grant Folds is a conservationist. He is an author, he is, um, he is a consultant and he has dedicated his life to African wildlife. Grant has been uh, instrumental in establishing habitat for rhinos and elephants in Amakala Game Reserve. He is the recipient of the Shackleton Award in Conservation at the Explorers Club in 2019. And he is up for numerous awards throughout the world for his work on behalf of African wildlife and African people. He actually helped to co-found an organization or initiative known as Elephant Art, which teaches uh, art to students and integrates elephant conservation in that, in that teaching. I can't think of a more noble or more dedicated way to approach conservation. With that said, I think we're ready to kick it off and, and see Grant in the field. So uh, Grant, I think we're ready for you to take it away. Good afternoon, welcome to Munyawana Conservancy. We uh, as part of the Mziki Private Game Reserve and we're celebrating World Elephant Week. I'm with a fellow conservationist Grant Folds, who's pretty well known around the world for his wonderful conservation work and I'd like to hand over for Grant to say a few good words about the Explorers Club. 
Yeah, thank you to the Explorers Club. Uh, great friends. I was there before uh, COVID um, at, uh, in New York and this is a uh, tribute uh, opening up World Elephant Week, uh, opening uh, Savannah Ele all about Savannah elephants in Africa. Uh, enjoy the show and I hope you learn something from tonight's episode. Thank you. Mziki Game Reserve which is part of the Pender Complex in South Africa KwaZulu-Natal and it's World Elephant Week. Um, we're so blessed I'm here with my friend Chris Small um, who has a, a game and share in this game reserve. It's fantastic now we're watching this beautiful elephant bull here. Um, I don't even know what age he'd be Chris what do you think mate? 30 plus. He's about 30. Bulls hang around on their own um, until uh, they need it by the herd and they get back into the herd and they mate with the females. So this bull, he's got a nice pair of tusks. You can see he's used the other one more than the, the one. So they, we have left and right handed in, in elephants. Now this is the Savannah elephant. I know this week in World Elephant Week at the Explorers Club in New York, you're going to be talking about other elephants, uh, the Indian elephants as well and those that are in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're dealing with two types of elephant in Africa. We have the forest elephant and we have the savanna elephant. Now in this great plain where we are here at Pinda Game Reserve, um, we have this is the savanna and this is like the Serengeti that all the people of the world want to come and see these great mega herbivores. And it's great to be able to protect them and create landscapes for them so that we can find more habitat for these animals that are disappearing. The only uh, enemy in Africa is obviously humans. They have no other predators that can kill a mega herbivore like an elephant, except obviously us humans. And it's up to us to be able to preserve these magnificent creatures. I think it's disappeared here. My driver is not doing his job. <laughs> Thanks over and out from Pendergamzu. from TCU study abroad he's an up-and-coming uh, basketball star and he's got a message for releasing these animals back into the wild oh, this, I think we should do everything in our power to take any any animal like this out of a terrible cap captivated situation and be able to bring it back to its natural habitat like this and give it the opportunity to live and roam in harmony like all the rest of these beautiful animals
Grant, that was incredible footage. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, we know that the African elephant is the largest land mammal in the world, the savannah, the bull elephant is the largest, of course. But we'd love tonight in Elephants 101 to learn even more about this magnificent creature. Can you tell us a little bit about Elephants 101 as it relates to the African savannah elephant? Yeah, I'm very privileged to be working um, uh, with savannah elephants um, and a few times uh, with the forest elephants up in Central Africa, having worked in the DRC um, and in West Africa for a short while. But um, my work is, is in a little bit of savannah elephants alongside rhinos, but uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm more of a conservationist. Um, and yeah, it's, it's this magnificent um, pachyderm that uh, we are blessed to have on this planet, and when they're gone, um, we kind of we, we've lost one of one of us. Well, Grant, I know that in so many ways, and, and I know our attendees are familiar with the African elephant as the iconic symbol in many respects of the continent. Can you speak to the status of the giant tuskers in Africa in 2021? Yeah, um, I'm very privileged to have seen um, and worked with and, and caught one or two giant tuskers. Uh, they are living um, in remote places in Africa, sometimes in Kenya. There's a reserve called Sava East, which has some enormous um, tuskers. Uh, the most famous died some time ago. His name was Satao. His, uh, he was, uh, his, elef his tusks were over 100 pounds. You know, he was an enormous boy. And um, they were dragging on the ground when they killed him. Uh, the poachers killed him with a bow and arrow. Um, really uh, terrible to, to know. Um, the other one is very close to home, to a reserve where I've worked on um, in Tembi Elephant Park in Maputo land, just south of Mozambique, uh, where the elephants, uh, the tuskers there, are also enormous. They've found refuge in, in a forested area where they felt safe, and I think it may be something to do with the genes and the minerals that have kept these elephants safe from hunters and poachers over the years and the genes of the tembi tuskers have just become um, really special and and probably the only place other than in kruger national park of course there are a few there um, but we need to save these things because um, you know the years of poaching have eradicated these big uh, arbory tuskers you know for or an illegal trafficking. I, I couldn't agree more. Their, their salvation must be our mission. Grant, when it comes to the, the giant tuskers, the, the analog on the other side of it is the, the occurrence of tusk, the tuskless gene in elephants. Can you speak to that and, and how that, in your, in your uh, experience, has evolved over the last few years and, and where it stands in the present? Yeah, this is a fascinating thing. Um, you know, Jim, I was busy catching elephants in 2003 nearly two decades ago for our game reserve in Amakala, and it was at Pinda, and the exact same place where I, I just did that clip earlier. And, um, you know, we've we discovered there was a whole group of cows that had the, the dominant gene for tusklessness. And on our research, we found that most of the elephants in the Ghana Resort and a lot of down, that's Zimbabwe, right down to um, so in Maputo, Mo Mozambique, were tuskless because the poachers had eradicated everything with big tusks and the breeding happened to be left to those that were tuskless. So it is a dominant gene like you get in polled animals and cows. There are animals that are naturally polled that don't have horns. But isn't it sad when um, we discover that uh, the tuskless cows have uh, dominated, not completely dominated, but have become more prevalent in our experience with elephants over the years because of poaching. I, I, I agree. Yeah, I find it very sad. I, I also find it amazing how resilient nature is in adapting very rapidly to this evolving situation on the ground and how elephants have responded in a, in a very rapid way to this the poaching that is affecting their populations. Uh, in, in speaking of their populations, Grant, I know that there's a there are overpopulation occurrence in certain parts of the elephant's range and zero population in others. Can you speak to that and how your work is helping to perhaps uh, moderate that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, during the civil wars of Angola, for instance, um, from 1971 to 2002, 
um, over 100,000 elephants were lost in Angola. Uh, the Angolan population, I'm naming one country now, has really had a, a very uh, bad effect on, on elephants. You know, Zambia had this a similar thing, but in the south, the elephants are starting to come back across uh, the Botswana and Zimbabwe landscape. Mozambique, we've lost an enormous amount of elephants. So those habitats are devoid of elephants, whereas in Botswana, um, you know, the, the population is estimated of 130,000 to 170,000 elephants in a small country. South Africa have an overpopulation of elephant, elephants because um, we don't have these natural rangeland expansion areas for them. Um, as do Zimbabwe. Uh, just recently, I was in Wangi, and uh, Wangi have a population of north of 45,000. I think they're only meant to have in the region of 15 to 20,000 elephants. So they also have a problem. So one thing we need to do, Jim, is to, is to get these other populations that are excessive and repopulate Africa. But of course, that needs a lot of funding. Um, and it needs a lot of resources and intergovernmental uh, organizations that work together. So it is a big challenge, and I don't know if my generation will ever get to that. I am certainly will try, but whether we will be able to achieve that in the time that we have left um, before it happens in the overpopulated areas of Southern Africa. Well, it is certainly a Herculean task, and that is to say the least. Brent, I, I also, in, in, in wrapping, because I, I know your time is, is precious and short, and you're, you're, you're in the field right now. We thank you for that, by the way, once again. But my question for you is, I want to really explore the human side of this a bit. And I know that the, uh, the Elephant Art Project is something that's near and dear to your heart, and it's, it is central to your work. Can you speak to that and what it means to the people of Africa? Yeah, um, you know that it's so important for us to be telling the generations to come and those that are younger than us um, that we need to preserve these creatures. And uh, firstly, uh, obviously, they need to know what um, the problem is and what what they're using elephants for. And obviously, that's ivory. Um, and then we need to tell them that habitat is the next most important thing. You know, um, so. After that, you know, we, 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 we have constructed or, or devised this thing called elephant art, which started, by the way, with a guy called Kingsley Holgate, who's a great philanthropist and uh, adventurer in Africa. And uh, he drew a simple outline of an elephant on a piece of paper, and he took it to children throughout Africa. Um, in Chad, north of the equator, right down to the Congo, I was there when we launched elephant art in the forest areas of the Congo, DRC. And uh, so far, we have reached many children with rhinos and elephants and actually gorillas, you know, telling them about the same problem, but with a different species. So if we don't pass the, the baton of conservation over to the youth, we're going to be doomed. So we really have to be sure that those that are in schools and those that are the caretakers of our future are within, um, they, they are able to affect change. They are the new generation agents of change that we have to be educating and we give them a lesson on a page basically uh, where they will Google, learn, discover, research the problems that we encounter on the ground and possibly create a solution for them. Thank you for sharing that brief glimpse at, at, on the program with all of us, Grant. I, I just want to say in, in closing that it is clear by your work what we've been able to glean tonight, that your commitment to and passion for the wildlife and the people of Africa is nothing short of astounding. Thank you for sharing time with us tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Good, Jim, and thank you to the Flores Club. Um, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of it, a small part of it. I just have a small medal like that, which I was awarded in 2019. Um, many of you will be watching, I hope, and uh, when the pandemic is over and we're allowed to fly and it's safe, I'll be back. We look forward to it. Grant, thanks once again. And now we're going to go live back to the Explorers Club. Great. And we're back. So uh, I know I speak for everybody when I say I learned so much in such a short period of time with spending time with Grant across the world, across the ocean. 
Uh, we have our next guest presenter uh, waiting to, to speak with everybody in just a few moments. Before we do introduce her, um, I would like to share a little bit of, of her background with all of you because uh, much like Grand Falls, it's, uh, it is quite extraordinary. Dr. Hannah Mumby is an assistant professor in the School of Biological Science and Department of Physics and Public Administration at the University of Hong Kong. She leads the Applied Behavioral Ecology and Conservation Lab for a vibrant and international group research social behavior, communication, personality, and conservation science with a focus on the right methods for the pressing questions. Before taking up that position, she was based at the Department of Zoology at the University of Cambridge, where she was a Brankel Weiss Fellow and Draper's Company Fellow at Pembroke College, where she wrote her first popular book, Elephants, Birth, Life, Death, and Death in the World of the Giants in 2020. In 2018, she was a College of Life Sciences Fellow at Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin. And in 2017, she was a Fulbright Scholar at Colorado State University. She's an honorary fellow at the Center for Afri African Ecology at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. She was a Leverholm Trust funded postdoc at the University of Sheffield, where she also conducted her PhD in 2014 on the association between life history and environment in Asian elephants under Verpi Huma. She did her undergraduate and master's degrees at the University of Cambridge. And in 2020, she was awarded the Christopher Bernard Award for a New Investigator by the Association for the Study of Elephant Behavior. We promise you experts and we've delivered. With that said, Dr. Hannah Mumby, welcome. Hello, nice, nice to see you. <laughs> it's nice to see you as well. And uh, we, we know that you got up very early this morning to, to meet with us, so we're especially appreciative of that. Now, I've read of, of your research, and there is so much to dive into, and we have a relatively short period of time. So this is the time when I do this, throw away the key, and, and turn it over to you. Please share your work with us. We'd love to learn more. Thank you so much, Jim. So I'm going to give a talk to everyone now. I'm really excited to be invited and to be talking to you this morning for me probably this evening for a lot of you. But I always say that one thing worth waiting, waking up for is elephants. So I've been asked today to give the introduction to Asian elephants. That's a species that I've got quite a lot of experience studying. I've also studied African elephants too. But I really wanted to think at it through this lens of why look at elephants as a question? Maybe you're super interested in elephants, but maybe you haven't thought of all of the different ways of looking at them. So it's kind of, for those of you who know it, it's inspired by the John Berger essay, um, Why Look at Animals. So taking you back to why I look at elephants, I think that this picture has a lot of that behind it because you can see here, there's an older female Asian elephant and the very concerned man standing next to her is um, the Mahout, who's the caretaker for this elephant. And he's looking very concerned because they're at an elephant hospital in Thailand. This elephant did recover. But for me, something that was really interesting as a biologist, and I actually think it was touched on in Grant's talk as well, was this um, relationship between humans and elephants. And it's something that I didn't fully understand until I really started doing research on these animals. And then once you kind of get a hint at it, you see it all of the time and in lots of different and really interesting ways. So really quickly, I'll tell you the life history approach, which is a kind of very specific aspect of um, evolutionary theory that is about how we trade off energy and allocate energy at different times of our lives. And that kind of determines the trajectory that we have in terms of timing of how we grow, how we reproduce, and even when we die. And that was what I really came into elephants interested in. But the cool thing about life history theory is even if you don't understand necessarily all of those little trade-offs that are going on, it's really familiar because what you're studying are these important landmarks in the lives of, in this case, kind of any mammal. So say as a human being, we're all born and then some of us, we get to grow up. So this is me as a toddler with my little sister. And then some of us go from being children to being adults. So this is me graduating from university. 
And then again, some of us are lucky to get to look after the next generation. This is me with my first nephew. I now have three nephews and two nieces. So I'm doing a lot in terms of helping the next generation come along. So why did I think about elephants when what I was interested in was the life of humans? Well, for me, it was this idea that it provided an even wider comparative framework. So instead of just looking at, say, the lives of someone like me in comparison to billions of other humans, what about investigating how elephants, the pattern of their lives play out, how all of those events are connected to each other as kind of a fellow mammal, but that evolved on a kind of convergent evolutionary trajectory in some aspects to us as human beings. What could that tell us, reveal, or contrast with a human life experience? So to that end, we can think about things like, oh, well, how am I or how are you like an elephant? Obviously, if you look at this photograph, you can probably tell who's the human and who's the elephant. So I don't think that we necessarily have to get into the differences, you know, very gray wrinkly skin, although I did get up this morning very early. So maybe I've got a little bit of that. Um, but there are some similarities that kind of go beyond those superficial differences, right? So large brains as even adjusted for body size. Obviously our heads aren't as heavy as an elephant's as Grant was saying, but those big brains, there's some parallel in there. The complexity of our social lives, probably all of you with the COVID situation have had this experience of, you know, kind of realizing what your social networks are and your social relationships are when we've been so isolated from each other. Um, Self-recognition, which is something that uh, Joshua Potnick's group worked on a lot, so the ability to recognize oneself, say, in a mirror. Um, cooperative things. You saw the picture of me looking after my nephew. Well, maybe... Um, there are lots of examples of related females maybe looking after younger elephants in the herd as well. So maybe me holding my nephew is a bit like an elephant in that respect as well. So we have these kind of nice parallels, um, but obviously also some differences as well. And that's actually what really makes it appealing to me because you know it's not just because we're closely related. So there, there might be hinting at some interesting things about evolution as well. So if we think about the life of Asian elephants, Grant told us a little bit about African elephants. It's broadly similar in Asian elephants. Um, average age at first reproduction for females around 18 years old. Um, they can have up to 10 calves in their lifetime, but it would average out maybe five or, or, or six. Some, some have fewer. The weaning age, um, so when they stop drinking milk, again, Grant touched on that, that it is kind of essential for them in the early months of life but a lot of them don't like to stop. <laughs> um, it, it can, if they're um, suckling continually, suppress the reproductive cycles of their mother. So it is an interesting thing that we like to study. Normally they are fully weaned between the ages of three and five, but they will maybe go for a little bit extra if they can get away with it. Um, interesting thing about males for me is that they might be sexually mature kind of physically at the age of 15, but actually if they're out in the wild, um, they might not reproduce until much later. So that's an interesting thing for me, kind of what do you have to learn about being a male um, beyond being physically capable of reproduction to make you successful? And I'm sure a lot of us would think about that with humans as well. Um, and then that long lifespan, um, elephants, Asian elephants sometimes even live longer than African savannah elephants. So kind of 80 uh, and over 80 would really be a maximum, but lots of elephants living into their 50s or 60s. And these kinds of numbers, again, are quite familiar to us as, as human beings, the kind of pace of it, even though it's a much bigger animal, the pace of life se seems quite familiar. But of course, as Grant touched on as well, there are lots of other good reasons to study elephants, and in particular for Asian elephants, I want to highlight um, the conservation side with the um, maybe fewer than 50,000 um, wild ele Asian elephants remaining, that there are issues with habitat fragmentation, that they are a kind of flagship species in terms of, we've talked a lot about animals being iconic uh, and um, the conservation value that they have, also the ecological value, their role in terms of like altering the um, vegetation structure 
um, seed dispersal and things like that, that, you know, all of these essential roles that they're playing, some of which we might not even fully understand, um, but, but that could become, you know, really impacting the ecosystems um, if they do kind of get extirpated. Um, and then also the complexities and risks of coexistence. So this, I know we talk a lot about it in terms of conflict, but the flip side being coexistence is also super, super challenging um, for Asian elephants. And we certainly don't have all of the answers there. A lot of that is about listening for me. And then the practical side, I think it is important to highlight the kind of how economically important Asian elephants are. And that could be, you know, in some places that they're still used for logging or transportation purposes, but also tourism as well. And I think we really can't also put aside this cultural and religious significance that they have. So we're gonna really quickly touch on three interesting things. I chose these for this talk because I wanted to give you some results we already have. We've got lots of other things we're working on too. So we're gonna really quickly look at weather and births and how we can use thermal images. And, and again, we've talked briefly about tusks. I'm gonna to touch on tusks in Asian elephants as just the kind of intro as well. So if I had to guess and assuming that a lot of our um, listeners today are listening from the US, if we were talking about seasonal variation in conceptions in human beings, and I had to guess what is the most common birth month in our audience, I would guess September. Because in a lot of Western human societies, um, there are more births than one would expect on average um, in September. And it's probably linked to the holiday season in December. Um, and something that I was really interested in with Asian elephants, because they do cycle through the year, um, like humans, instead of having 28 day reproductive cycles in females, it, it's more, more like 16 weeks rather than four. Um, but I was really interested in, is there any variation? And one thing that I found out was in logging elephant in Myanmar, so elephants working in the timber industry, 41% of all the conceptions occurred during their annual rest period. So again, this kind of holiday or break period between February and June. So this was really interesting to me that maybe there was increased opportunity, more contact with other elephants, or maybe it was just kind of a less stressful time for them during that holiday period. And the interesting thing for me was in humans, the variation in conceptions doesn't always extend to variation in survival, say survival of infants in pre-industrial Finland didn't kind of vary that much based on that um, se seasonal effect. But with elephants, elephants conceived in the rest period had improved survival through to the age of five. And this is really cool for me because it's like, oh, are the elephants somehow timing their reproduction to improve the survival of their offspring? That's really super interesting um, for me. So yeah, this is research that I did back during my PhD, but I just wanted to show it to you. And then the other side of life in terms of mortality, um, and I don't know if it'll come as a surprise to anyone here, but we observe more deaths in elephants at extreme temperatures and um, in dry months. Um, especially extremely high temperatures. And the cool thing for me about this was really thinking, okay, well, there's an elephant, there's this big, you know, creature that looks very sturdy. And yeah, it can be affected by these fluctuations. And I think the important part for me was thinking about, well, if you do have an animal like that, it is a large body size, it is a challenge for an animal to regulate its body temperature. And then if it is doing activity, during the day, say logging or something like that, we do have to consider how is that going to affect the animal. And um, even though, you know, it looks like an elephant, super big, super sturdy, these variations could be really important um, and, you know, ultimately be linked to mortality. And then especially also, we should always have in the back of our mind, the changes that are taking place more widely, say with climate change and how they could play out too. So, Elephants might do various kinds of activity. This elephant's transporting grasses for food. This elephant is interacting with people. I'm not saying that those are a bad thing, but it's just interesting to kind of understand, okay, well, how do those affect them physiologically? Is there anything that we can put in place to make sure that it's even safer um, all of the time? 
So this is work that my PhD student, Hannah Tilly is doing, um, taking thermal images of elephants. And it's really cool because you can kind of see the core here and then the ear where they would dissipate heat. So get rid of some of the heat that they're storing is, is much cooler than the surrounding area. So this is the kind of data that we're analyzing when we're looking at these thermoregulation. And it's super easy. All you have to do is have an attachment to your phone and you can take these kinds of photos. But I will tell you, if you don't have the attachment and you are near an elephant and you're curious about that core body temperature, you can do an old school, wait for the elephant to poo and immediately after it poos, stick a thermometer in that ball and it'll give you a nice, measure of the core temperature as well. So you don't always need the fancy technology, but this is what we use to measure different parts of, of the exterior surface. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about is this idea that only male Asian elephants have tusks. You might see the small ones, tushes um, just below the lip line on females. But in a way, this makes the tusks even more interesting for me. I know Grant touched on tusklessness that's quite common happens also in Asian elephants but I just think the tusks can tell you so much so I wanted to show you this picture because it does show you some variation there's not just variation with age there's individual variation in tusks like he said there's right-handed and left-handed tusks sometimes we observe notches and things our untusked elephants use more or, or they specifically use for digging You'll notice that all the elephants here have the tips of their tusks removed. This is mainly for safety um, in these conditions with captive elephants, but this elephant has like, really nice thick tusks. And I wanted to show you this picture as well with this elephant interacting with its tusk. It really kind of hints at some of this individual variation um, that you have in kind of all aspects of elephants. They're so kind of specific and uniquely themselves is um, a really nice thing that we study. And these numbers on the side, uh, they're chalk, uh, chalked on, are their ID numbers there. Um, I am showing you this photo of African elephants, massive apologies, um, but this is the ones that we did the study on. Um, we basically did a study, you can look it up, and I can tell you all about it, um, where we estimated tusk size of all of these individuals. These are just using standard survey photos going back into the 90s. So they didn't have known focal distance. But just by looking at the number of pixels that the um, tusks take up in, in comparison to other proportions of the head or body, we can estimate the tusk size of the elephants really well. So it's like you don't need a new camera. You can go back through the old data sets and get the tusk size of your different elephants at different ages. Um, so that was a really nice study too. At the moment, I'm working mainly in Nepal, so I wanted to big it up and tiger tops reserve where I'm working. And this is my other PhD student, um, Sagarika Falk. Um, we are working on understanding human elephant interactions out there in Asia. Like I said, mainly in Nepal, we work a little bit in Thailand as well. So we have all of this work ongoing that is kind of temporarily on hold because of the pandemic, but super interesting stuff on kind of preferences, individual level interactions and things like that. So please keep us in mind and keep an eye out for the next things that we do. But in the meantime, I wanted to thank all of my team and all of my funders and rather cheekily, um, apologies for this, plug my book. If you wanna find out more, there is a picture of an African elephant on the front because there's African and elephants, Asian elephants in it. But this is really me writing about my field experiences, interactions, thoughts and reflections on working with elephants and it was super fun to write. So I would love you all to read it as well. Um, no pressure, but I really, really enjoyed it. And thank you so much to the Explorers Club for giving me this opportunity and sorry for the shameless plug. <laughs> and not a shameless plug at all. That, that represents your, your great work and, uh, and I'll be sure to read it. And I'm sure many in our audience will read it as well. So I, I just wanna mention a few things that, a few observations here. When you're talking about the elephants, there are so many parallels. I, I know you're sharing them, but the more we look, it seems that the, the deeper those parallels go between elephants and humans, for one. And secondly, I also want to thank you, reiterate our thanks, because uh, you got up extraordinarily early, because it's about 7.40 Hong Kong time right now. So uh, thank you once again for making this all possible. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted, wanted to mention that I have one question that I will share with uh, folks at the end. I just want to get myself in the queue because I want to ask you a question about elephant lifespan. I'm fascinated by that. So. Ooh, okay, I'll prepare. <laughs> awesome, I think you're well prepared. I'm not worried about it. 
but uh, we'll, we will we will connect with you shortly for the Q and A session. Uh, we thank you very much, and we're looking forward to it. Okay, next up we have Andrew Schultz. Now, Andrew is an elephant biomechanics researcher and a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech University in Atlanta, Georgia. Andrew's research thesis is on mechanics and materials of the African elephant trunk with applications to conservation technology. Now, Andrew works to understand how the elephant trunk is able to move in so many complex ways without having any bones or joints, only muscles. He's looking to find inspiration in biology to design robots that have both strength and flexibility like the African elephant has already evolved. Mother nature is the greatest inventor, right? He's also working to understand how STEM scientists can help impact conservation through the use of technology and human-centered design, which has led to his international work with the giant panda and other endangered species. Andrew, it's a pleasure to be joining you tonight. We're so happy that you've made time for us and we look forward to learning more about your research. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, can uh, can you hear me? Okay. Big thumbs up. Yes, we can. Great. Well, uh, I'm I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for the Explorers Club for uh, for letting me come and talk to all of you about elephants and uh, specifically elephant trunks. So, um, like uh, like I was introduced, I'm currently a third or fourth year kind of in the mix a PhD student at Georgia Tech. And uh, I love this picture. It was taken by Adam Thompson uh, with our collaborators at Zoo Atlanta. And it really shows you uh, kind of the beauty and grace of how elephants are able to do something is grabbing a rutabaga chip with those two fingers at the tip of the trunk. And, uh, and I'm actually going to start my uh, pr presentation uh, very similar to uh, the last presenter in terms of talking about. So like, why am I actually studying an elephant's trunk, and uh, and I'm a mechanical engineer. And the first question I get every single time is, Andrew, what are you what are you doing studying the elephant trunk? And and I like this graphic because it kind of shows you a little bit of if we think of the elephant as this this massive animal, right? And and it has this massive trunk. What we're really doing is we're looking at the large scale, so looking at the entirety of the elephant trunk, but. A lot of people know the elephant is wrinkled and has these wrinkles along the skin. So why does the elephant have these wrinkles? And we can even go further. And in this picture here, as we go further, we can think of this kind of at the meter scale, and then we can get all the way to looking at the individual fibers in the skin. And it's really a fascinating thing. Some of the things that we can, we can discover. And so as an engineer, this has a lot of applications for, for robotics. So if you think of an elephant, uh, it's, it's perfectly adapted to be able to move through almost any environment. It can maneuver through obstacles. It can grab a various range of objects with different kind of, uh, kind of grace, if you will. And uh, this has inspired a lot of people to look at them for robotics. So this is from Festo Corporate. They looked at this uh, bionic handling assistant that is inspired by, by the elephant trunk. So now what uh, I know a lot of people might think um, a bunch of different things about the elephant trunk, but what do they actually use their trunk for? So it's, it's kind of boiled down to these five main tasks. So the first one being breathing. I love these photos of you can see elephants using their trunks as snorkels. So they'll be going through pretty deep bodies of water and their, their trunks will be out of the water um, as a breathing mechanism so they can traverse these pretty deep uh, parts of water. We talked earlier about sound production and the ability that they can actually communicate with, uh, with others using, using their trunk. If you've seen movies like Lion King and stuff, you can see the elephants trumpeting at the beginning. Touch, so uh, elephants will touch different objects uh, and each other. Uh, I believe uh, a lot of pictures that we've shared uh, from, from all the different presentations today have showed how they use touch. Olfaction, this is a fascinating study where they saw elephants can actually sniff um, a TNT at higher percentages than bomb sniffing dogs. So they have this tremendous ability of olfaction or sniffing. And the manipulation, so I'm gonna mainly be focusing on manipulation today. Uh, and this is uh, where I started. So uh, when I started my research, the most kind of updated idea of elephant anatomy of what is inside the elephant's trunk was this beautiful monograph from Boas in 1908. 
And uh, this is of an Asian elephant, but it's been over a hundred years since some of these things have been investigated. And we introduced both African and Asian elephants. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the difference. And um, Asian elephants have the, a finger at the tip of their trunk and then a bulb of cartilage at the base, which you can see in this little monograph here, whereas African elephants actually have two fingers. So they kind of have an opposable thumb, uh, if you will. So I like doing this in every talk I give. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard elephants have 40,000, 110,000 muscles. So this was a idea, I believe, discussed um, at a pub in 1750 um, with a naturalist that was staring at a, at a, at a bone, uh, at a skull of an Asian uh, elephant. And he claimed that elephants have 40,000 muscles in their trunk. And, and this is not true. We're, we're looking at a more, um, a, a actual updated and more specific number, but it's probably closer to about a thousand in terms of these, um, these muscles inside their trunk. But yeah, I, uh, I see that all the time, wherever I go and people ask about it. And it's, it's really not true as an estimation made, um, so, so many years ago. So there's this fancy word known as muscular hydrostats that was coined by biologists. And what this means is it's uh, appendage made purely of muscle. And when you look at something like the trunk, right, it's all muscle. There's no bones, there's no joints, there's a little bit of cartilage, some blood vessels in there, but it's very similar to our tongues. So you think of the three main ones are, it's the three T's, tongues, trunks, and tentacles. And these muscular hydrostats have these abilities to do all of these different types of movement with this muscle. So you can elongate and elephants can grow and grab different objects. Elephants actually shorten when they suction up and drink um, liters and liters of water in a day. They can bend to do different things, wrapping around trees and they can twist to, uh, I love this, uh, this is just an elephant uh, picking up as many rutabaga cubes as possible through twisting its trunk and wrapping around in sort of the sweeping motion. So to go through some of the experiments that we've done, um, just to highlight some of this is we, we started just, okay, what can an elephant do? And what we found is as we're investigating these things, such as an elephant lifting a barbell and wrapping uh, with this chalk drawn that we can track using um, different software, that elephants, when they just use their trunk, it's, they're not necessarily as strong as a lot of people might assume. They can only lift about 60 to 70 kilograms. But the reason that this is so small is we restricted this only to, the, to their trunk. And so we restricted um, their head in terms of where they weren't able to use that massive 25% of their body mass head uh, to lift. And when they use that, they can, you know, bull down, bulldoze down trees and do things that are up to 400 and 500 kilograms um, have been documented. But this is their limitations and capabilities in terms of wrapping. But what about, what about how do they use some of the internal mechanisms and what is kind of the lower end of what they can, what they can grasp? So I love this video. This is uh, an elephant suctioning up water, but we didn't really know how to visualize this. So normally engineers use these like fluorescent beads, but we didn't want to do anything that would harm the elephant when we were working with the zoo. And so one of the zookeepers mentioned, what about looking at chia seeds? And this is uh, this next video is the bottom view. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I, I love this image because you can see, you can actually see the change of pressure there and the bubbles forming as they're suctioning up this water into their trunk. And we didn't really know what was going on, but one of the things when we looked at that video that was fascinating is when we were looking at kind of this, this elephant entering the water and elephant suctioning, we noticed that their nostrils were getting larger. So they were like dilating these nostrils. And what we were able to do is with the head vet at the zoo, we we're able to do ultrasound. So just like um, looking at uh, pregnancy, and we were able to see this expansion of the nostrils up to 14% for really heavy liquids. And when they do this, they engorge this nostril and they increase the diameter, um, sorry, the volume of their nostrils by about 60%. And this is one of the reasons they're able to suction so much water up so rapidly and store so much in their trunk is they can expand this to really give them more volume so they can kind of take a bigger gulp, if you will. And I, I just want to show you this video one more time because I think it's cool. Once you mention it, you can see, you can see them expand, right? You can see them kind of dilate 
uh, as they're drinking this water. And that's what allows them to drink about three liters of water in a second, which is pretty astounding. And this is fluid. So elephants also use their trunks to breathe. So this is where we can look at the other end of things. We, we have elephants lifting thousands of grams in terms of a barbell. Well, what can they do with a tortilla chip or a tostada? And this experiment um, was, I think, one of the coolest moments of, of my research so far of looking at that they can actually pick up this, this tortilla chip that weighs something five to 50 grams, depending on it. And they actually suction air up at um, predicted about 150 meters per second in order to grasp onto that tortilla chip. And we did this experiment tens of times and every single time the elephant did not break the chip, which is pretty miraculous to think of this. And, and when we look at an elephant using kind of both, you can see this is them grabbing apples, uh, cut up apples and rutabaga underwater. And so you can see the chia seeds are helping us visualize what's going on around the rutabaga and chia seeds. But um, how are they able to actually sense a lot of these things? Like an elephant is going and they're picking up this tortilla chip without breaking it. Well, one of the most, I guess, like unknown facts that I didn't know until I started this is elephants actually have whiskers. And uh, they, the fancy term for these is vibrissae, but you can see all this dense packing of whiskers all throughout the trunk. So this is how they're able to sense um, a lot of the things around them. Just like humans, we are able to sense some things through touching our skin. We can feel those differences on our hairs or like a mouse or a cat that has vibrissae or these whiskers on their hair. And some recent studies we've been doing is we see that when they can actually stretch by about 25 to 30%. So these muscles are able to really be able to extend to grab far reaching objects, which is pretty incredible. When you think of having something that is like two meters long, you can extend by several centimeters in terms of in order to grab some of these far reaching objects. So I talk, this is kind of the macro scale. And as an engineer, what I'm doing is I'm looking at, so this is a, this is kind of a, um, you can see here, this is a green tiff. And what this actually is, is all the way down at the size of a pinhead. This is what the, the skin of the elephant trunk actually looks like. You have this dense array of all these fibers. And that's why elephants have this sort of Kevlar that's still flexible in their skin. So using this, we can look at creating new robots or even creating new materials. But I like to describe the trunk as a muscular multi-tool. And this is something my advisor, David, who, and I talked about is when you look at something that can kind of almost do anything, right? They're able to lift these, these 60,000 gram barbells with pretty much ease, but also they can break a tor They can pick up a tortilla chip without breaking it all while having the ability to extend by 30% to have this toughness of their skin. Think of it like a multi-tool where each of the um, different functions in terms of sound production, smelling, touch, olfaction, all of that are parts of this multi-tool, which are able to help them interact with their, with their environment. But to kind of wrap up, I'm an engineer and I hadn't taken a biology class in, in years when I started this project. And something that really bothered me was I'm working with these amazing animals, but uh, they, they are starting to go extinct. And this is um, what led me to kind of start a little bit of, of this movement in terms of in the engineering um, program I'm in. So how, how can we actually make sure that we can continue to gain inspiration from nature? So we have these, these amazing animals like the elephant and sure they make great uh, inspiration for humans to use, to look at robots and stuff, but we need to make sure that future generations can continue to have not just inspiration from these, but these need to be in the wild as a keystone species and really helping um, the environment. So something right now that we're going through is the great acceleration is what what it's been termed and we think of all of these things are accelerating as we go um into into the 2020s in terms of uh extinction is peaking for all different animals from mammals to birds to fish but also things like global warming and those things are also accelerating so how can we mitigate that well humans are mostly the cause of getting us into this mess. So a lot of this is humans get, getting ourselves out. So 
what I have worked to do at Georgia Tech, and we're working on expanding this, is having students do different projects uh, using the idea of human wildlife center design. So you've likely heard of things like human wildlife conflict, human wildlife interaction. And what we're looking at here is how can we create different types of technology to help mitigate um, and help with human wildlife interactions. So a lot of people immediately, when they think of technology, they immediately say drone. Oh, Andrew, you're working on drones. It's not just drones though. What we're working on is a, a range of different sort of ideas. And, and I, I have this picture of salmon here because what, something that's um, big in the United States and the world is mislabeling of fish. And so a lot of times what can happen is actually endangered species of fish will be labeled different types of actual fish for sale. And it's led to a tremendous amount of overfishing in areas as well as a lot of issues in terms of conservation status of fishes. There's monitoring. This is an open source uh, acoustics technology known as the audio moth uh, policy. So looking at, uh, there's this really cool project going on in Northeastern Africa where they're looking at actually using um, different and new types of technology of weaving to create new synthetic uh, furs for tribes to be able to use um, synthetic and uh, mimic furs. So they don't actually have to use um, things like lion furs in their rituals. And they're working with those communities and working with the values uh, as well as traditions of those communities to make sure everything's right. And then I include the impossible burger there um, on, uh, on the bottom of the slide, just as sort of a conversation starter. So is this an idea of conservation technology or is it not? And there's a lot of different opinions around things like this, but yeah, that's something that I'm working on. And I hope that together uh, as engineers, it's really important for engineers not to just focus on where can we gain inspiration, but how can we continue to conserve these species using things like technology um, in terms of genetics policy uh, monitoring and uh, other, other. So to end, um, I would really like to thank uh, all of the elephant keepers. These are six elephant keepers, Katie, Scott, Steve, Nate, Josh, and Caleb at Zoo Atlanta that have all been instrumental in every part of my research uh, along the way. And, uh, and yeah, with that, um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out on Twitter. Um, that is my Twitter line, but I think next up is questions. So thank you, everybody. Andrew, thank you. And we're going to dive into questions right now, but the chia seeds, by the way, genius. Our first question is, uh, is from Kellen, and Kellen wants to know, often as humans, uh, we overheat and our ears get red. I wonder if that happens with elephants too, or perhaps not enough blood circulation in their large appendages. That's for our experts. So Hannah, perhaps, does that, does that work for you? Does that ring a bell? No, not as far as I know. Okay. All right. So, so I can, I can, I can touch on this a little bit. So when, uh, the big difference between humans and, and elephants in terms of thermoregulation or, or heat is the idea of, so humans have sweat glands, right? So everywhere, everywhere we have, um, all, and we're able to sweat, sweat out, uh, that, but elephants do not have sweat glands. Um, and again, uh, uh, I'm going to probably say something. Uh, I'm completely skilled with African elephants, so I might say something that is completely not true with Asian elephants, and please correct me. But what elephant skin does have is a lot of these wrinkles along their trunks are actually cracked. And these cracks allow for, there's this beautiful paper that was made where they looked at how these cracks are kind of these interconnected channels where elephants can throw mud water and sand and it spreads throughout these channels and it's kind of like having sort of this cooling sort of rub all throughout their body and so you see elephants throwing these different substances on themselves and that's one of the ways that they're able to really um, cool off and I think a lot of uh, people only think of elephants ears as a way for them to cool off but in fact I believe it's only about 10 to 15 percent of how they thermoregulate in terms of uh, compared to using that cooling kind of property of their skin. They're Thank also kind of like camels that they can store heat in the day and then release it at night when it's cooler. Thank you both. Our next question is from Jim. 
He said, uh, thanks to the club for hosting this and thanks to the presenters for the great content. Thanks to everyone who cares about these incredible creatures. Um, and Emily, how did elephant culling impact elephant overcrowding? Also, how and when did the elephant line branch off into African and Asian? Um, so this is, I think, a little bit into evolution. And I will, I will say that this is way out of my wheelhouse uh, in terms of when, when did they branch. I do know, I think, um, until I think it was the 18th century, it was believed that all uh, elephants were the same. And uh, there was a French naturalist in 1750, the person that actually um, claimed that elephants have 40,000 muscles that looked at the skull and noticed that the skull um, and the skull shape was different between the two. Uh, but in terms of the evolutionary history of, of them, I'm not sure when, uh, when that actually occurred. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so there was actually still until very recently, this kind of split between savannah and forest elephants was something that was questioned. And it's only recently, even that the IUCN has kind of recognized two separate species. So even though we have kind of genetic clocks and markers and things, it's still kind of being discussed. And it's also kind of um, with the split between Asian elephants and African elephants, was that before or after mammoths? I, I think on the whole, the general consensus is that um, Asian elephants and the line that was associated with mammoths, that split happened before the um, forest elephant and savanna elephant split. Um, but for the precise dates, then I would suggest to, again, it's like not my specific field, um, but I would say, you know, we're, we're talking about maybe 1.5 million years ago in the region of for African elephants, but I wouldn't, you know, set that in stone. There's a lot of research being done and, and more information coming out all the time. Thank you. Emily has another question. Uh, does an elephant lose its whiskers? Vibrissae sense um, as they grow older. Do they lose sense as they get older with their vibrissae? And likewise, humans lose their sense of smell and sight and so on. Do their trunks grow weaker and less agile in time? Yeah, a lot of stuff to unpack here. So uh, in terms of whiskers, so um, not at all. So they, they don't uh, lose whiskers in terms of, well, let me rephrase. They lose whiskers, but they don't lose sensing capabilities. So like with uh, things like a mouse, a mouse has a single spot and they'll have maybe three hairs that are from that exact same spot. And all three hairs are performing the same sort of task. It's in order to sense when things are coming into contact with that. And there's this really cool stuff in, um, I think the, in like neuroscience where uh, you can look at whiskers on a mouse and they perfectly map to the brain in terms of how they're able to sense things. And so elephants along their trunks, they will lose hairs, but they have other hairs in the area that are able to help them feel and interact with that surrounding environment. However, just like humans, and I'm going to completely forget the name of some of these things, but um, there are elephants that have been born without any hair. So you can see, uh, and um, in terms of elephants that do not actually have any hairs uh, on their tail or uh, on, on their trunk. In terms of developmental and how does that change over time? That's something um, that's actually uh, one of the next things that I'm looking at because it's, it's really not known well how their trunks change over time. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the question they mentioned, you know, are, are they constantly right? If you think of, if you've ever woken up from a really, really long nap, uh, your, your muscles will be fatigued, right? Because you haven't used your muscles after a really long time. And so likely after elephants have, uh, are growing older and older, they're actually able to um, lose some of the uh, actual pure strength of those muscles um, due to deterioration. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, do elephants get colds? Do their trunks get stuffy? And part three, I suppose, what diseases are they susceptible to? Uh, um, so first off, I want to say, uh, to Hannah, I love the, 
study that your PhD student is doing with um, taking thermal cameras uh, in terms of it's, it's really fascinating because that's really not something that's been done at all uh, in, in, in the past of understanding how, uh, how can we actually look at these thermal image to understand? And to that person's uh, question, I think that's literally a possible outcome of Hannah's study that's not even maybe intentional is what is some of like, how cold do elephants actually get? And being able to look at, uh, I think it would be fascinating. Um, we got to talk after this because we're doing some of the same things with African elephants for different reasons, but looking at some of the differences and uh, African and Asian elephants live in a whole host of different climates. You talked about desert environments earlier in forest environments and tropical environments, and there's likely different types of um, getting hot or cold in terms of that. But elephants will uh, join together um, in pretty tight herds. I, I know when it's cold out. So there is likely uh, there is likely some idea of getting cold, but I think using kind of the power of the herd, they're able to uh, regulate some of that. And then diseases. Um, TB is, is a big one. Probably those of you that have worked in zoos or, or know zoos. And actually for me, that kind of highlights that interaction between elephants and humans because if you've got tb in your human population it's going to get into your elephant population so this kind of one health idea that everyone has to be treated um, elephants are less likely to get cancer than humans that's something that we do know um, but probably again anyone who's got any familiarity familiarity with with elephants in captivity would know worms parasites can be issues for them and serious issues and they can also have huge issues with their digestion so i know it's not technically a disease but things that can cause morbidity and mortality in elephants you know just i mean sorry for anyone having breakfast or dinner constipation can, can be a huge problem thank you both uh, jenny has a question for us uh, could you speak of the common ancestor of mammoths and the modern elephant, and what do we know of its origin? Well, <laughs> we're getting on, on to kind of um, questions that I'm not a specialist in, but obviously, yeah, there are shared co common ancestors. And, and when we talk about kind of nearest living relatives to elephants, obviously we talk about like manatees, rock hyraxes. Um, it was, and if you do look at the kind of, I always say today is not the great age of elephants, right? We have three species around, but in the past, there were many more other species of elephants. So that kind of diversity gives you an indication into what the last common ancestor probably looked like in that it, you know, basic things, quadrupedal mammal. There, there's aspects of, I'm sure that Andrew can speak to this better than me, this kind of trunks and, and trunk length and stuff like that in, in the different species that um, were part of that kind of diverse range too. There's, there's this really great um, exhibit at the, um, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but it's in London. Um, the London, I think Natural History Museum has a bunch of uh, scientific illustrators that have taken some of these different skulls of uh, distant elephant, elephant relatives, but as Hannah mentioned, um, in terms of trunks, it's kind of a guess. If you look at an elephant skull, uh, or if any of you have ever done any sort of biological um, testing, the first thing to go is normally, you know, all of all of the uh, muscle. And so when we look at uh, preserving things, right, this is sort of where if you look at things like dinosaurs, people originally, you know, didn't think they had feathers, and then they had feathers, and then there's, but science is constantly changing. So there might be a time in the future where we're able to predict better on how these trunks really looked. But right now, normally how long, how large, uh, and some of those things are complete guesses. Because if you, if I would um, challenge all of you to look at an elephant skull and just an elephant skull, you can Google one right now and try to imagine that it has a trunk and then just think about, okay, how long is the trunk? Is the trunk wrinkled? Um, it does the trunk have nostrils, right? There's all these questions that are not really easy when you look at a trunk, but then if you look like at a human skeleton, you can go, oh, the, those are the ribs. Those are the arms. That's the head. And it's much easier to kind of generate um, a full mental picture of what they look like. Thank you both. Um, 
Another question, uh, how can we help to protect them in the terrible situation as temperatures rise? What insights from your research can, can help to inform those, those answers? Shall I go? Um, so I, I think one thing that we can take into account is that, you know, especially if they're captive elephants or they're, they're elephants that we can monitor really closely, is their access to food, their access to water, them maintaining their health, safe body temperature, all those things. And the great thing about that is you can be relatively hands off doing that. Um, because it's about, you know, knowledge of the environment and observations that you can make of them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of intervention, right? But that's on kind of like the small scale of watching specific elephants. Obviously, there's a huge bigger picture, which is the populations in some areas are declining quite steeply. The habitat that's available to them isn't what it used to be and what there is might not be very well connected. So then we also have to kind of zoom out and think on that scale as well. Like if we want elephants around, where are they actually going to be? Is it going to be possible for them to make sense there, get enough food there, have enough space there? And those are conversations that we have to have kind of scientific experts, but in collaboration with, you know, people who make decisions about land use um, and, and things like that. I know that Grant talked about, you know, there being pressure on some areas and not on others um, in terms of some, some areas maybe are losing their elephants and some maybe are having some pressure for, from the population that they are supporting. So that kind of illustrates the different scales that we really have to be thinking at. Yeah, and I, all of that is is true. And and the other part that's, I think, a little bit more individual is learn yourself about elephants, about like, what are some of the things that are actually the biggest threats to elephants in the wild? And one of the things that I've, when I first started this research that I learned very quickly is a lot of those are very different for African and Asian elephants. And, and I think a lot of times we think of elephants as, an umbrella. And it's just like everything that is affecting African elephants is affecting Asian elephants. And that's really not true. So what, what I recommend is there's a lot of ways to get informed and I will shameless plug. Um, Hannah's book is a really good way to, uh, as one of those things in terms of getting informed, because having people that have been in the field that have worked with these animals for, for tens of years, that's the type of experience and stuff where you can start to learn about people that have interacted with them. Um, and if you talk to different people who have worked with elephants, they will tell you a lot of other good resources um, in order to get informed about what are some of the things um, in terms of their behavior and what are some of the threats to their actual survival. Thank you both. You, you actually were able to jump ahead without knowing it and, and answer some of the questions that were in the queue. And really, one of the questions which, which comes to mind, how can the audience help most? And, and I think you both hit it right on the head there to stay informed and be informed in terms of like nights like tonight, for example, speaking to the experts and learning from their research. Uh, another question here, um, what conservation programs in your experience are most impactful uh, for saving species uh, and secondly, evolving your field of study, how that may evolve your studies in particular. So in, in my line of work, um, I've, especially on the technology side, it's very obvious to see successful interventions of technology and unsuccessful. Um, and one of the things that's the most important is you need to be working with people that are in the field that are interacting with these animals every single day. There can be this idea of a silver bullet solution where people will, will build this technology and they're gonna save, the, you hear the word, they're gonna save the world with this and they've never talked to anybody who's ever gonna use this technology. And one of my favorite stories with this is uh, from one of my um, peers, Shaw Selby, and he talks about how he was in Botswana and they were looking at um, a, somebody really wanted a drone to look at, they were dealing with poaching, uh, not poaching, uh, they're dealing with uh, pirates were taking fishing vessels. And then he looked up at a hill and he was like, wait, there's a, there's a hill that overlooks uh, this cove. Are you able to see everything from that cove at, at night. And he was like, yeah. So all they actually needed was somebody with the binoculars and a flashlight to signal 
when a pirate was there. And that's a lot of times the idea is people don't actually talk to the people that are having to deal with these challenges and situations. And it's the same in human problems as it is with human wildlife interaction is you need to be talking with the people actively investing and working on if it's a technology intervention, if it's a conservation intervention, any of that, you need to be thinking of the values, traditions, and cultures of the people in that area. And, and that's, I think, another big uh, thing with, with, and this is something to me that's really important when you're looking at um, things like zoos is, are they working with conservation organizations that are in the natural environments of these animals? Or are they strictly kind of keeping things in terms of, and that's where you can get to, uh, not to get too in the weeds, but you can get into some of these situations like uh, the popular Netflix show, Tiger King, um, in terms of not actually having any invest um, investing on something like a conservation organization. Thank you. Uh, Emily has a question. Uh, what are some of the impacts of elephants in religion and culture where you work or where you have worked perhaps? The impacts of elephants on religion and culture. Um, her words were the impacts of, of elephants in religion and culture, but yeah. I'm sure, yeah. No, 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 but because I was gonna say, it's so hard to tease apart what it is because they're so integrated into it, right? So, so it would be really hard to kind of say which came first. Um, but obviously, because I spent a lot of time working in um, Asia, you know, the really interesting thing for me, like one study that I did was kind of like Andrew said, I, I trained like full disclosure. I trained originally as an anthropologist. So I always have this kind of ethnographic thinking in the back of my head whenever I'm doing a study. And one time I thought, oh, I'm just going to sit and talk to the Mahouts. And of course I came up with quite a structured questionnaire. And then I realized it's better just to let people talk sometimes. So, so I let them kind of free range. And something interesting that I found was this idea that kind of when they, when you ask them about their job and how they do their work, when we have a conversation like that, it's very much like, I'm an elephant driver. These are my roles. You know, like, you know, the conceptualization of the elephant is almost like a vehicle. But then you, if you ask the question a different way, then you get the answer about an elephant being a god. So you've got to be really careful as a researcher not to just take that first answer and just be like, okay, well, this is kind of a very um, practical thing. This is the way that people see elephants. Like, no, we've got to take those blinkers off. Just take a pause, see the bigger picture in the setting that you're working in. Accept. I'm not going to understand everything of this, but of course that I can see it's extremely important. And that's really where I think that we have to be super careful, especially someone like me, I'm a British person going into these contexts. That's why you have to have local partners. That's why you have, I, you have to have like local students, people that like make your team diverse and you'll learn as much as possible about these things. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have another question here uh, from Luna and th this is I think going to be our, our wrapping question. Can you share your thoughts on the story of the elephant herds leaving their homes in the Hunan province of China and traveling long distances in search of a new home? Yeah, this has been a big story, obviously, where I am in Hong Kong. And I think that the striking thing about it and the thing that we have to think about, and I've talked to colleagues in China about this, is it might not be this um, conscious decision about finding a new home. It might be this idea that, you know, the management of the elephants there is extremely specific. There's, there's a management decision that's been taken that we're not going to intervene with the elephants. We're going to observe them intensely. So, so a lot of observation of the elephants. But basically, we're, what we're going to do is to keep people away from them. So if you think about it, it's kind of the opposite to what we do in a lot of places, which is, you know, when the elephants come into this um, area of human occupation, whether it's farmland or residential area or something else, then the kind of position is, okay, we, we should move them because they belong in this protected area, for example. Um, whereas it's a very specific situation that's happened in, in China. They don't have so many elephants around and these ones 
are considered to have extremely high conservation value. And so the policy kind of is, we're just going to let the elephants move and then we'll kind of leave them to it. And I think the reason that this kind of thing played out is because we don't see that very often. And so maybe we don't see those long movements of, of elephants anymore. And that's why it kind of seems so striking and unusual. But there's the difference in policy and the difference in practice that we have to think about that, that might be linked to that. Andrew, a final word on to Hannah's commentary? Yeah, I would just say I, I loved um, probably my favorite, favorite slide um, of, uh, of any of the talks today was Hannah's slide of, of the different tusks, because I think it really orchestrates well um, in terms of where we're talking about this specific herd in a specific area right and if you take the exact same herd the exact same area just in what in a parallel universe as as we can maybe it might do something completely different right so one of the things about um elephants is they're really really complex and i'm just going to kind of reflect back to what I talked about earlier is a lot of the different things um, is when people look at something that happens in China, they will try to relate it exactly to something that happens in Africa with an elephant or something like that. But again, they're two completely different species and they have a lot of differences in terms of how they interact with humans. They have a lot of differences in terms of their natural environment. And so I would encourage people to just think about um, comparing the, and thinking about each of these as really separate species and thinking about the different ways um, and kind of personalities that each, uh, each of the species has. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached that part of the program where we're, we're going to uh, be thanking all of our wonderful presenters. So for Mr. Grant Fouts, for Dr. Hannah Mumby, for soon to be Dr. Andrew Schultz, Thank you all very, very much for your participation tonight, your expertise, and uh, getting up extraordinarily early in some cases. Uh, so thank you for that. We also want to thank all of our Explorers Club members and guests from abroad, from Europe, South America, the States, Africa, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us. We have some housekeeping notes coming up for the presentations for tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, I'm just accessing my notes here for tomorrow. Mr. Mark Fowler, our VP of Conservation, will be leading the uh, will be um, leading the conversation with our experts. Uh, we have we have uh, Brian Christie, who is the author, founder, and former head of species of special investigation at National Geographic. And we have Dr. Paula Kahumba and her bio. I have her bio right here, and her bio is that she is one of Af Africa's best known wildlife conservationists. She's the CEO of the Wildlife Direct which seeks to change hearts, minds, and laws so that Africa's wildlife endures forever. Among some of her accomplishments, she is the uh, hands-off and out elephants campaign creator, and she works with Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, the First Lady of the Republic, Republic of Kenya. Paula is also the winner of the Whitney Gold Award in 2020 and 2021, rather, the Rolex Nat Geo Explorer of the Year in 2021 the Whitley Award in 2014, the National Geographic Howard Buffett Award for Conservation Leadership in Africa, and is a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Paula received her PhD, excuse me, <clears throat> in ecology from Princeton University, where she studied elephants in coastal Kenya. And those are just the highlights, ladies and gentlemen. There's more to come. Uh, further in the week, again, please join us for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, experts every night, on the subject of elephants and elephant conservations, so we can learn more about what we can all do. Thank you once again for joining us at the Explorers Club. We wish you a great night and a great week. <laughs>